what comes next for Mosul, the new FBI director, and the summer's hottest sex-crazed medieval nun comedy. Beautiful morning, sister. Hey, don't fucking, fucking talk to us. Get the fuck out of here. Former Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva was convicted of corruption for taking bribes and sentenced to nine and a half years in prison. The still popular politician wants to return to politics and is expected to appeal. Lula's conviction is just the latest development in a massive corruption probe that's now ensnared three consecutive leaders of Brazil, counting former President Dilma Rousseff and current President Michel Temer. The EU Commission says Greece's public finances are back in order, at last. After years of spending cuts and tax increases. The signal is clear and massive, is that uh, Greece has fulfilled its commitments towards the European Union and the Eurozone. The recommendation brings the country closer to returning to the international bond markets, which it has been largely excluded from since the Eurozone crisis in 2009. Two Chinese warships filled with troops set out for Djibouti today as part of China's effort to establish its first overseas military base. The Chinese government did not release details about the number of troops on board, but a foreign ministry spokesman said the base will help China contribute more to global peace and stability. State-run media made a point of noting, quote, it's not about seeking to control the world. Strict new limitations on refugees entering the U.S. are now in effect. The U.S. has reached its new annual cap of 50,000 refugees this year, after the Trump administration cut down a previous limit of 110,000. That means that until the next fiscal year starts in September, no more new refugees will be allowed in, unless they meet the standards of having a bona fide relationship with a person in the U.S. Vast swaths of the internet protested FCC Chairman Ajit Pai's call to roll back net neutrality rules. Around 800,000 websites displayed pro-net neutrality messages to show their dissent. Tech giants Google, Netflix, and Twitter directed users to the FCC site where the public can post comments on the proposal. Even Pornhub, one of the world's most visited sites, took part with a message of solidarity against the rollback. Strikes and heavy gunfire continued to shake a city that's been at the center of fierce fighting for months. And where, three years ago, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi first declared an ISIS caliphate. American military officials said they still don't know whether the elusive leader of the Islamic State is alive or dead. But what is certain is that a monumental task lies ahead, rebuilding what's left of Iraq's second largest city. This was where Baghdadi was standing, right here. That was where he delivered the same. Where do you think he is now? <laughs> Alive? I hope. I hope so. Abu Bakr al Baghdadi's only public appearance here could well have been his last. After nine months, thousands of lives lost, and the destruction of neighborhood after neighborhood. ISIS has been driven out of Mosul. See, there's actually an Iraqi flag now, just on the base of the building. That's what was blown up by ISIS before it could be. OK, let's get down. There are still pockets of resistance, but Iraqi forces are celebrating victory. How long have you been fighting for? Does it feel like it's over now? Daesh, no Daesh. No Daesh. No Daesh. But the price has been heavy. The level of destruction in the western half of Mosul is breathtaking. In the old city alone, more than 5,000 buildings have been damaged. Some of Mosul's neighborhoods are more than 80% destroyed. The UN says it's going to cost at least a billion dollars to get even the most basic infrastructure up and running. Removing the rubble alone will take months. 
مجال عملنا بعد مناطق بعد ما رحنا عليها بعد Faisal Mohammed is in charge of putting the city back together. He's now overseeing major projects like repairing this sewage draining system that was badly damaged by airstrikes. We can see Mr. Mtatawar Jiddan, and Bunya Tahtiya, and Mishari, Fallam Fahala, and can Thas Thas Sanawat Waksa. Mudda Hassab and Mishari, and it to Karra, the Darat Ali. Amma Ida Amar Rafal and Pav, and Mifayat, and Fatah Shawara, and Khadamat al Basita. أن العملية لا لا تكلف أكثر من أشهر يعني لا تنسى أن حاليا نحن يعني عملنا في جزء من المدينة يعني أكو أكو هناك مناطق ما رحنا عليها بعد. repairing roads and bridges, rebuilding schools, fixing damage to public parks, medium scale projects like these have been greenlit by Mosul's governor even before the money to pay for them has arrived. Nafal Al Hamidi left Mosul when ISIS came in. But he returned when the eastern half of the city was liberated to try to get things up and running. But what are the things you need from the government? From, the first from one, the, that's the money to complete. If you have more, more money, we must to become successful. The lack of post-ISIS planning has alarmed many here. Bad blood between Mosul and the central government in Baghdad is partly what led to ISIS capturing the city so easily in the first place. There's a crisis of trust among returning residents, even as they celebrate newfound freedoms hundreds of feet from where ISIS was fighting just days ago. This is West Mosul's first pop-up pool club, a sport banned under the Islamic State. There's a sandwich business in the corner, next to a hole blasted by ISIS fighters so they could cross from one house to the next without being seen. This is Daesh? This is Daesh? This is the star player is 20-year-old Mohammed Ahmed. So you can play at all under ISIS? No, I can't. I can't. I'm going to go to the side of the road. I'm going to go to the side of the road. I'm going to go to the side of the road. I'm going to go to the side of the road. Mohammed's been coming here every day since it opened. He's a student, but there are no classes since the university was destroyed. Like many of the young men in here, He's unhappy that it's taking so long to get basic services up and running. A few blocks away, Al Hassan is picking up what's left of his home after it was destroyed in an airstrike. الصاروخ أول من ضرب ضرب إيه هذه المنطقة اللي غادي ضرب أول واحد هنا هنا لقينا لقينا نص جثة لقينا الباقي هنا. We first met Ala back in March at a hospital in the nearby city of Erbil. His four-year-old daughter Hauda was blinded in the blast. Her mother was killed. Months later, Hauda's eyesight has returned after a number of surgeries. The doctors say she still has severe trauma, but she's doing better than before. Ala is now living in a rented apartment. He's got no idea how he'll afford to rebuild. He preferred to sell the house because of everything that's happened. But until it's fixed up, he's stuck with it and all the memories it holds. Chris Ray, President Trump's pick to lead the FBI, went to Capitol Hill today for his confirmation hearing. And while these days the FBI seems to be synonymous with the Russia investigation, Ray will have a long and totally unrelated to-do list. Josh Hirsch has more. Chris Ray had no trouble answering the questions that many people assumed would be the trickiest ones, even when it required that he contradict the views of the man who nominated him. Do you believe that in light of the Don Jr. email and other allegations that this whole thing about Trump campaign in Russia is a witch hunt? I did not consider Director Mueller to be on a witch hunt. In normal times, that'd be the end of the story. Ray is a shoo-in and seems almost typecast for the job. Low profile, nonpartisan, 
a former assistant attorney general who helped prosecute Enron and later threatened to resign, along with Jim Comey and Bob Mueller, over the Bush administration's handling of domestic surveillance. He says he'd do it again if he had to. If the president asks you to do something unlawful or unethical, what do you say? First, I would try to talk him out of it, and if that failed, I would resign. But these aren't normal times. After all, if Trump hadn't prematurely fired Comey earlier this year, you probably wouldn't have heard of Chris Ray. There wouldn't even be a job to fill. And that's what former FBI agents I've spoken to keep saying they're most concerned about once Ray gets the job. How does he get a bureau of 35,000 people back to normal? Back focused on the sort of mundane stuff that doesn't make headlines, but keeps America safe. In his three years on the job, Jim Comey had a list of initiatives for the FBI to help it catch up with the 21st century. Diversity in the ranks, women in leadership, the growing threat of cybercrime and online terrorism. Today, as one former top official told me, the Bureau is still way behind where it needs to be. It also needs a new home. Its current headquarters is literally falling apart, like chunks of concrete being held up by nets. But earlier this week, with no one at the helm to get the Bureau's back, the government canceled its search for real estate after almost 10 years. Chris Ray's new job won't be totally firewalled off from the Russia drama. As FBI director, he'll be responsible for investigating criminal activity coming out of that country, including things like hacking, which the president hasn't exactly been eager to pursue. But it's making sure that stuff doesn't interfere with all the other stuff he does, the normal operations of the bureau, that will be Chris Ray's biggest burden. 2017 is only halfway over, and in the United States, it's been a bloody six months. There have already been more than 8,000 shooting deaths and more than 16,000 gun-related injuries, according to the watchdog group Gun Violence Archive. In Chicago, the violence has been so intense that President Trump announced at the end of June that he's sending in the feds. About 20 ATF agents armed with ballistics technology that can help solve gun crimes. It's a tool that already seems to be working in the places where police have the resources and commitment to embrace it. 2015, gun crimes here reached a peak. 479 were committed that year. The number dipped in 2016, but already this year the force has seen gun crimes tick up again. I don't think I've seen a fist fight for years. You know, I, I remember when I came on, people used to fight, and now everybody just grabs a gun, so. Go inside, girl! Ready? Apart from fighting the gun problem on the ground, Cincinnati is also using a tool that's less action and more CSI. It's called the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, known as NIBIN. So once we hit the button, it tells us all the suspects that were involved in the different crime scenes that the casing matches up to. A database of bullet casings run by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. This is the firing pin impression. Where Every gun leaves unique identifying marks on a casing. Kind of the fingerprint of the gun. That makes them key evidence, because NIBIN can link multiple casings found at different crimes to one gun, and sometimes one criminal. Oh, I know. Here's how it works in Cincinnati. Came around the bend right here, coming towards me. Yes, sir. They were loading the weapon back up. CPD's gang enforcement unit is called to respond to either a shooting or a shots fired scene. We got a shell case here. When they find a casing, whether someone was hurt or not, it's treated like an important piece of evidence. First of all, anytime you have someone who rides through a residential community shooting a firearm, the likelihood of them using that gun in some other capacity is, is extremely high. So it makes collecting the shell casings very valuable. And so what happens next? It, it goes back and it gets entered into NIBIN. The officers are going to go ahead and, and tag the item. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put it into our property room. Josh, come here and pick up those pro that property. And then our, our NIBIN specialist go, retrieve it uh, tomorrow. Everything is then brought to the NIBIN lab for processing. Okay, so this is the casing that you guys saw last night. There, casings are cleaned, 
and entered into a system that creates 3D images. We're going to find the area we want the algorithm to analyze. They're sent to a correlation center where they're compared to casings found at other crime scenes for matches. We did get a Niven hit. That data is sent back to the cops, and detectives will follow up on any potential hits. So that, that one firearm is linked to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight crimes. After years of trial and error, Cincinnati's Niven process is a model for others. Police departments come to them for training. We had 426 people shot in Cincinnati last year. We didn't have 426 individuals each pulled the trigger once. We've got 40 to 50 that repeatedly pull the trigger. They shoot two, three, four individuals before we can finally put a case on them. So how do you measure success with Niven? Well, we know that Niven played a large role in our shooting reductions for last year. We were one of the few large Midwest urban cities that had a reduction in both homicides and total shootings. Cincinnati's Niven process is a success. But it's been a challenge to implement here and in police departments across the U.S. There are less than 180 machines nationwide. Machines cost as much as a quarter million dollars to buy. And using them correctly requires a mindset shift from cops, who tend to think of bullet casings as trash and the CSI stuff as boring. It takes somebody describing it to you and then seeing it. Those are just some of the challenges ATF has faced as they try to widen the Niven network. So do you think that ATF maybe made a mistake in not getting out there and telling police departments, you need to do this quickly, this is the right way to do it? I think police departments in general are reactive. I think there was a time when a stop sign shooting occurred, shots fired. I don't think the officers would have gotten out of their cars to pick up the cartridge cases to submit. But now I think officers are actually responding to the scene. But the federal government and ATF could do more to make this tool universal. As Newtigate points out, they've done it before with national fingerprint and DNA databases. That's lacking for Nibin. There's not a police department in the country that's going to say, we wouldn't submit those fingerprints into APHIS. National practice. We get DNA at a crime scene. Everybody's going to submit that into CODIS but we are not submitting that ballistic trace evidence into Niven. At some point, it's got to be standardized practice. So far, Republicans have been trying to go it alone in overhauling Obamacare, and it hasn't worked yet. They've already had to push back their summer recess. And now they're asking the Congressional Budget Office to score yet another version of the bill, which drops tomorrow. If that doesn't work, they might have to consider something truly radical. Majority Leader McConnell is trying to get 50 of his fellow Republicans on the same page, with Vice President Pence as the tie-breaking vote, to get repeal and replace done. If he can't figure it out in the next couple of weeks, he'll either have to move on or compromise. My suspicion is that any negotiation with the Democrats uh, would include none of the reforms that we would like to make. Translated from McConnell speak, that's a threat. That if he's forced to sit down with Democrats, the outcome would be much less conservative. But there are others in his conference who seem to be more concerned with collapsing insurance markets and less with partisan politics. My hope is that we can avoid the mistake that President Obama made when he passed a major health care reform bill, the Affordable Care Act, without a single Republican vote. We got a hint of the problems the market may face next year on Monday. Only 141 insurance providers have submitted applications to offer coverage on the Obamacare exchanges. This is a 38% drop in filings from the same time last year. The number's gonna change, but what it points to is less competition and higher prices for people buying insurance on the open market. So there's political and industry agreement that these problems need to be addressed. And it's not like compromise is totally foreign to these people. There's an example of it this week in Congress. It's called the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA. It's a measure that governs how the Defense Department spends money on war, planes, Gitmo, everything. And believe it or not, the legislative process on the bill is bipartisan. It even got out of committee with only one Democrat voting against it. But there's a hitch. 
I talked to former Senator Jeff Bingaman of New Mexico, who once tried to forge a bipartisan compromise about health care back in 2009. He told me that it's a lot easier to get votes from both parties for a defense bill that supports our troops than it is for reforming health care, because Obamacare is really a law about taxes, which is a third rail for a lot of Republicans. I think it's going to be hard to get a compromise between the two parties, precisely because Republicans are not going to want to have their fingerprints on anything that results in increased taxes. They've been trying to repeal those taxes now for a long time, and giving up on that is a bitter pill to swallow. In The Little Hours, an indie comedy released this month, foul-mouthed nymphomaniac nuns run wild in a modern take on medieval times. The film is based on a story from the Decameron, a 14th century Italian classic about young people who hole up in a villa to avoid the bubonic plague. Director Jeff Baina and star Aubrey Plaza can explain. Well, I just found that you dog-eared that page. Probably from college. And it says, Misato of Lamparecchio pretends to be dumb and becomes a gardener at a convent where all the nuns vie with one another to take him off to bed with them. That's pretty much it. A good friend of mine, Joe Swanberg, who's also a director, was crashing at my place. And we were just kind of getting fucked up. And we watched dog TV, which ostensibly is for dogs. But around 11 o'clock, it just gets really trippy. It's definitely not for dogs at that point. It's just like weird, like bubbles. It just gets like really, really psychedelic and trippy. So we were just watching that and we were talking about um, this movie he was working on and somehow it came up that I had studied the Decameron and I guess sexual transgression in the Middle Ages. And he got really like pumped up about that and was like, dude, you gotta make this movie. So um, the next day I called my producer and I told her, hey, like I know, you know, this is coming out of nowhere, but there's this idea that I had and it would just take place in the Middle Ages. And she freaked out because one of my investors, she's from Tuscany, she had been asking this investor group for like four years to shoot in these medieval villages she had access to in Italy, and everyone thought she was a crazy person. So when I brought up the idea of shooting this medieval movie, it just like fit perfectly. So within a month of having this basic idea, I was out in Tuscany um, looking at all these locations and scouting. And then within six months, we were shooting the movie. I knew about the idea really, really early on, obviously, because we lived together. I grew up Catholic and I went to an all-girls private Catholic school when I was going back and kind of researching prayers and prayer services and stuff like that. It, I, I was kind of blown away by how much I remembered. There were elements that I kind of incorporated that I think uh, sort of, I guess, were definitely inspired by who Aubrey is in real life. My attachments to donkeys. Yeah, she's super attached to donkeys. So what Jeff wrote and what the cast received was a very dis very detailed, very descriptive, but there was no dialogue written. So every scene was improvised. And as you can see, there's really not much dialogue. It's just sort of this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. So that's what we all read. And so what we would generally do is take two, three or four takes and sort of find the scene. When you're shooting a movie like a studio comedy, with like Judd Apatow or, um, you know, one of the big kind of, you know, studio comedies that happen nowadays, that's a really different kind of improv. It was less about finding humor sometimes. It was just about sort of finding a tone that existed somewhere in between comedy and drama. Did you roll your eyes? Where there's funny moments, but there's also real moments. Did he just smile at you? Why is he smiling? Who is that? I who, don't know. Wait, who the fuck are you? Who are you? Who are you? Fernanda, stop! He's an intruder. I don't know who the fuck he is. Let me get Mother Maria. Fine, go. You know, 
know, a lot of times comedic improvisation is, is literally just people going on riffs. And this was us trying to find something a little bit more cohesive. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, July 12th.